If this is your first time here, The Rebel Rebel is a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs who decide to say screw it to the status quo and do their own thing. Some people are born this way, others wake up and simply choose to do something they've never done before, and still others plot, plan, scheme for years to create the life they've always wanted. I'm your host, Michael Dargy, and these are their stories. You can help fund the rebellion and support this podcast for as little as $5 a month on our website, therebelrebelpodcast.com, via PayPal, or through Patreon at patreon.com slash rebelrebelpod. Thank you so much for your support. It means a ton. Please welcome to the show Martin Izod of Malsan Motorcar, an amazing and talented human who not only restores the dream cars of your childhood, but flies, rides motorcycles, and even water skied on one of the most famous rivers in the world. Enjoy the show. Well, welcome to the Rebel Rebel, and I'm sitting here with Martin Izod from Malsan Motor Car Company. How's it going, Martin? Oh, Michael, it's absolutely terrific. It's really good. <laughs> That's great. Now, in a twist of irony, you walked here to the mm-hmm. studio instead of driving. Yep. Um, what's the temperature like right now? It is minus 12. Ah, brisk little, then. Little brisk, mm-hmm. little brisk, but I do have to get my uh, my steps in. <laughs> good man. <laughs> well, you're looking very spelt, sir. Well, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. So, um, just to catch people up, can you let us, you know, let the listeners know who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is uh, Martin Izod. My company is Mulsan Motor Car Company, mm-hmm. and we restore um, classic automobiles. You've got like a whole bunch of cool cars. What's uh, yep. what's in the shop right now? So, uh, quick rundown. We've got two Lamborghini Countaches. Oh, um, 1985 poster. 85 poster. Then they are the quintessential Lamborghinis because they're red with a tan interior. Oh, my God. I have Both the QVs, yeah. the downdraft models. Uh-huh. Awesome. Yeah. What else you got? I've got four Jaguar XKEs uh, convertibles, uh, 1939 BMW four-door sedan. Oh. Um, crikey, there's so much. A Jensen FF, okay. first four-wheel drive production car. Wow. Um, oh man, there's, it, it, you, you start to go blind after Yeah, a sure, while. like yeah. lots. Um, yeah. So uh, Lamborghini Countach, like, are, so is this something that you restore from, uh, like, how does that process work? Somebody's like, I want a Countach because it was my dream car? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a... Um, a doctor bought this Countach to me, and he bought very, very unwisely. Oh, no. Um, but I guess you can't ever unwisely buy a Countach. I think it, it mainly boils down to what you paid for it. Yeah, right. Uh, because all of them will need or have been restored at some point. Oh, sure. So this one, uh, it really did need to be restored. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, uh, and how long of a process is that? That one... Uh, was, I'd say, coming up to two years. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah well, I, I can imagine it's probably hard to find parts. It's very hard to find parts, but, the, you know, there's a fine line you've got to draw between restoring a car and just buying parts for a car. Oh, okay. Because the purist would say you've got to restore the parts that come off the car originally, whereas someone oh. who just wants a checkbook restoration type of thing would just go, yeah, yeah, I, I just want this built Sure. As soon as possible, buy this piece, buy that piece, yeah. and it wasn't off that car, which uh, to me, I guess, is a little bit sacrilegious, but <laughs> gotcha. I'm not the one paying the bills. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, wow. And it, uh, so you also have a parts uh, side of your business as well? Yes, yes, Tree Frog Auto Parts. Yeah. And that, that started through necessity, really, um, I get such a lot of um, parts that are not necessarily surplus, but right. are left over from a car which I will never use again, but will definitely be useful to somebody somewhere and should be repurposed. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so let's back this story up mm-hmm. and uh, and go to why Martin decided to start restoring cars and even what's your favorite car? Like, how did this all wow. start? It all started, I was in a fairly, for want of a better discretion, a a better word, a high-powered job in England. Okay. And at 34, I realized that that was not it. It was, everybody, I guess, goes to work to make money. Yeah. But 
money seemed to be the overriding sort of thing that was controlling me. Gotcha. And at 34, I, I took a look at where I was and thought, I, if this is going to be the rest of my life, then no, yeah. that's that's not what I want. Yeah. So it, it, so you just picked up a wrench? Like, were you just always wired for... <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. um, when, when I was young... Um, we had, you know, fairly humble beginnings, I guess, and my dad was always repairing his own cars. Oh, okay. And I always remember it, and I'd be the one holding the flashlight while he wielded a pair of uh, pliers, a, a yeah. flat-bladed screwdriver, and a very large hammer. <laughs> and um, <laughs> The bangometer. Yeah, exactly, the bangometer. And, and we repaired, we did brake jobs, we did valve jobs, and all sorts of yeah. jobs that he, frankly, couldn't afford. Okay. So I got my introduction to mechanics that way oh my god that's oh, awesome yeah uh and what's your f- absolute favorite car like what sort of got you inspired to work on because you do like concourse restoration mm-hmm. uh, well it, it's it's shifted it used to be um aston martin db4 okay oh, and aston which is an absolute phenomenal car but i guess as I've aged, I've mellowed a little bit, and, <laughs> and my absolute favourite would be uh, Bentley Continental. Okay. That, I mean, that is the epitome of style, luxury, and just grace. It, it, it's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. So when you approach a project to, like, mm-hmm. restore one of these cars, like, how, you come at it from, I don't know, the perspective of you know, you love everything about the car. Like, can you walk me through like sort of Martin's process to take on a project? Martin's process is, uh, how do I put it? You've got to love what you're doing to be in restoration. Okay. Uh, If you take it purely as a business, it, it, I feel it just won't work. Okay. Because you've got to want to do it Uh, because it's, it's such a massive roller coaster of a ride. It's not just get one in, rip it down and, like they do on West Coast restos or whatever. I mean, yeah, they, sure. they just, it's a pressure thing. There's no way. You've got to gently persuade the car <laughs> that it needs to be restored and it'll fight <laughs> you every single inch of the way. Really? Yeah, and you, it, and a lot of times you have to walk away. Really? Yep. You have to just walk away, let the car sort itself out, so to speak, yeah. and let yourself sort yourself out uh, and just get yourself in a mind space and then and look at the problem again. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's a bizarre process. Huh. <laughs> I guess the the thing that's always sort of stunning to me is that how long these things take. Like, mm-hmm. I, like this is years of your life. Yeah. Uh, or the owner's life, yeah. waiting for their baby to come back. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, just for example, you can pretty much buy take a, an E Type Jaguar. Or XKE, you can buy pretty much anything for that car now. Oh, but the purist, as I am, you can buy a set of gauges for it. Yeah. But to restore a gauge, uh, like a fuel gauge, would take five hours. So five hours at shop rate is grossly disproportionate to what you can actually buy one. For. Gotcha. And I'm not doing it because I want to make money on labor, I'm doing it because that very gauge came from that very car. Right. And the funny thing is, my clients get it. Yeah. They absolutely get it. And we had this big interview phase when we first start the project. And I asked them what type of restoration they want. Yeah. And the majority say, no, no, no. We want to have a faithful restoration. Right. You know, don't don't buy the parts, and I mean, unless of course it's it's just ridiculous. Yeah. But most of it isn't. Most of it is just a matter of you sit down behind a your bench and yeah. you gently take apart this gauge, mm-hmm. and you have yeah. tweezers and things like that to to remove the little needle, and you straighten things out, and you re with a tiny little brush you re um you put new figures wow. on the face. Oh my god! Or you can get uh, get them silk screened. Yeah. Uh, which is which is a good option, but very often you can't do that. Man, that's cool. It's very intricate. Yeah, but, uh, shit. <laughs> so you can, so you can get a car, um, the body wise. As long as you've got a good body, you're fine. Yeah. Um, you can get a car to a driving car in say a year. Okay. It then takes another year to apply the detail to that car. Wow. Um, so 
the correct nuts and bolts for it, for example, the heads of the bolts have all got certain markings. And for a concourse oh. car, you've got to have those certain markings. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's detail like that. Um, that engages and switches. And, and yeah. it's, it is very, very beautifully complex. <laughs> <laughs> is that sort of what, what drives you? Like, are, are you beautifully complex? Um, I've not ever heard myself described like that <laughs> but i guess yes yeah and i i found that I, i've changed over from my uh career in england i found that i've changed such a huge amount yeah what drives me is totally different now to what has previously driven me interesting and it's 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 a good i think it's a very good transition nice yeah. Um, what is like the one car that you've always wanted to work on that you haven't or to restore, not work on, but what would be your dream? I guess my dream would be, it would be a Bentley Continental. Yeah. I've worked on a Bentley Series 1, the four-door sedan, but, yeah. but not the Continental. I would absolutely love that. Okay. Yeah. Hear that universe? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I've put it out there. Now yeah. I expect it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, that's really cool. Now you do, uh, you have done other things. You famously have got a propeller, uh, in your, uh, in your office, <laughs> yes. yep. uh, from yeah. a plane that you crashed. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It was a very sad, uh, very sad day. I, I built this plane with a, a friend of mine, Cam, and, uh, he had the money. I didn't. And yeah. I went down to Des Moines in Iowa and built this plane because of the 60-40 law, um, the plane has to be 60% built by a factory, and then you go and oh. basically assemble it. Yeah, okay. So I built it down in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, um, assembled it, flew it, test flew it, and brought it back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was great. But Cam basically screwed up. Uh-oh. Yeah, so when we were doing a test, engine test on it, yeah. we needed some gasoline, and he had a beautiful acreage. And he had these farm tanks with farm gas in it. Oh, no. Yeah. So I said, do not use farm gas. Yeah. And so basically he ignored everything I asked. <laughs> and, uh, oh, no. And the water, there's always water in farm gas. For some reason, it just is. It's the way the tanks sweat. Yeah. And uh, so I was, I was taking off and water got into the carburetor. The engine quit and I flew straight through a fence. Oh, God. Yeah. So I guess it, part of it was... Um, yeah, it was just fate, I guess. Yeah. And stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep the propeller? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and various other pieces of mangled wreckage, <laughs> just to give me a, a chuckle every now and then. I walk into my, uh, my sort of uh, studio, which I've got at the front of my workshop, and I look at these pieces uh, and just snicker. I, yeah. just, I just laugh. Things you've done. Yeah. I got out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, when was the last time you flew? Oh, crikey. It was about 18 months ago. Oh, 18 really? months, two years. Yeah, it was quite a while. Okay. Uh, but I've taken up gliding. No way. Yeah, gliding, uh, paragliding. Yeah. And this is much to my wife's uh, amazement. I'm, uh, I'm now building a powered parachute. <gasps> yeah. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, so basically you have this huge motor. or not huge. It's, it's a motor strapped to your back with, yeah. a, with like a four-foot diameter... Um, <laughs> propeller and you go up in a parachute as opposed to yeah. you know, leaping off a mountain oh my god that's awesome oh it's great it's absolutely fun oh yeah and so well you can just and you don't do you have to file a flight plan no you just no nope. strap you, this thing on and off you yeah go. so you you uh on my way home from work for example i go past uh south calgary airfield yeah and there's loads of them down there really oh yeah loads of them Oh, my God. So uh, I first, I was intrigued by it. I wanted it because I'd landed there a couple of times in the plane that I built, yeah. uh, which is illegal, FAA. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and um, I saw them down there. So I went back down, and sure enough, there they were. Wow. This guy who was actually building them said, yeah, he'll, uh, he'll give me some plans, or I can build or, or uh, buy a, a finished article. Jesus. Yeah. How fun is that? Oh, it, it's amazing. You, it, it's it's a bit, little bit of a tight envelope that you've got to fly in. Yeah. Uh, you, the the wind can't be above. I, I personally would, wouldn't take off in anything over, say, 10 knots. Oh, okay. It would be a bit dicey. And it can change pretty quick. Oh, yeah. 
uh, here, especially oh, yeah. in the foothills. Yeah, but you don't you don't want to get above more than about five hundred thousand feet, thousand feet max for me. Oh, okay. Because it can you can really get some strange winds, as you as you mentioned. Yeah, I've got a friend that flies helicopters, and he, yeah. he says it gets really wacky. Oh yeah, <laughs> and out of nowhere, it yeah. can just come out of nowhere. But the good thing is, I mean, if you have a problem, the engine quits. Doesn't matter. You just yeah, parachute. That's it. You just glide down right. and alight gently on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing well I say a light I mean I tried my first flight was uh, with Willie Mueller uh, okay. in Cochrane Willie Mueller was uh, quite the character he uh, he held the um, endurance record for a, a, not a paraglider a uh, hang glider oh wow yeah and he was my instructor oh okay and the weird thing was when I um first went out there he said okay he's put me put me through flight school yeah. he learned that i already i could already fly so that took a lot of the the lessons away yeah so we walked outside and strapped on the parachute and he said okay first thing you've got to do is, is learn how to kite so i erected the chute above my head controlled it with the left and right risers and i'm just standing there and said okay now what he went well nothing i guess just take off just walk <laughs> off the cliff so i did and it was absolutely it was, it was wonderful wow I it was I, wonderful I can't imagine and he annoyed he, he was so annoyed he had this uh, bullhorn uh -huh. and he was shouting at me because i'd figured out that if you just pull gently on the risers and collapse the chute a little bit at the ends i don't know the actual technical term for it but you actually get some lift right and i was supposed to just do an a, like a, a simple you jump off land and let's let's learn from there. Right, next but, step. But of course, I didn't. I, I then started to race up and down the escarpment, <laughs> and he was going nuts, shouting at me. And I, so I, 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 I landed. Too, too, bit, too busy <laughs> having fun. Is it because Cochrane? They do. Uh, I don't know. They still do that, but they used to do hang gliding right off the mm. cliff there. That was it. That's where I went yeah. off. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, oh, it's my, great. My uncle once told me that. Uh, if you want to take up skydiving, it's a lot like turning yourself into strawberry jam. Yes, like it's it can end very badly very quickly. It, yes, I, I remember one. I was having way too much fun, and this was about five years ago, seven years ago. And um, I was with a friend of mine, and we were both sort of just not playing around, but we were too intent on chatting with each other as we came down. The ground came up, and you sort of start to break, and. I, I screwed it up completely and basically piled into the ground. Oh. And I can remember, and that was that was for my 60th birthday I did that. Yeah, that was it. It was about five years ago. So I remember picking myself up off the ground going, oh, I am too old for this shit. <laughs> I mean, it really hurt. <laughs> right. I, I bounced, bounced back normally, yeah. but no. Oh, my God. That one, that one left a mark. Uh, are you still playing? You're a musician as well to yep. round things. I feel like Buckaroo Banzai, like... God, you do everything. <laughs> so uh, are you still playing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're now into um, sort of fusion jazz. Damn. Um, a little bit of funk thrown in. Yeah. Um, the old standbys of um, rock and blues are always there, yeah. and I'd have so much fun playing with these guys. I mean, we're the, we're the most weird, eclectic bunch you've ever met. That's awesome. From all walks of life. Yeah. So it's amazing. Fusion jazz. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, so it's uh, it it is good fun. But the people in the band, we've got a, a um, high court barrister who does capital cases. We've got a ER doc. We've got a IT guy. Uh, we've got a psychiatrist. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's it's just it's just strange. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a strange mix. It's great though. That's yeah. what that's what music should be. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so in all of your, so here you are, you've got this, uh, successful restoration company. Um, you've, uh, you've seen a, an opportunity to sell parts that you can't use in your current vehicles. Mm -hmm. So you've got that offshoot. Um, you are building a propeller <laughs> parachute flying thing. Yeah. You play in a, a fusion jazz band. Yeah. What don't you do? Wow. Um, I've regularly updated my bucket list yeah. and really and truly I'm running out of stuff to do. Yeah. Uh, so I suppose my goals are uh, trying to get myself in peak fitness. That That's a very good yeah. goal for me. 
Uh, and I've never been unfit, but it's a matter that obviously as you progress in your life, you, you, you find certain weaknesses. Right. And it's my goal to keep myself as mobile and active as possible. Yeah, that's great. And intersperse that with doing stupidity, uh, stupid things. and yeah, boy. yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Oh, cool. riding a bike. Lo- I love biking. Yeah. Just got myself a Ducati ST4. What? Yeah. No yeah. way. Yeah. What'd so, you do with your Harley? I still got it. Nice. Yeah. So I've got to sell that. Uh, what there's no you, point. What are you selling it for, sir? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's more undue pressure has been placed on my nuts to uh, <laughs> to get rid of these. I've got enough cars as well, so I need to really start to you know sort of rationalize the thin whole the herd. thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Very, thin it's the herd. Caddy, hey. Yeah. Damn. Have yeah. you taken it out yet? Like, when did you nope. buy it? Nope. Uh, in actual fact, it was a bit of a trade because I had a hot rod that was an abandoned project oh. at the at the at the workshop, and the guy just walked away from it. Wow! You know, owing me money. Right. So I then advertised it, and it's such a long protracted story. But then the, this guy from really cool shop in High River, Aces of Speed, came along and said, nice. "Tell you what, I'll swap a Ducati because he sells motorcycles as well. Nice. I'll swap it for your hot rod." So I said, done. Yeah. Yeah. He, he wrote it out there and showed it to me. Yeah. It is, it is absolutely stunning. Oh, my God. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have to do some riding this summer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's either a matter of selling the Harley or the Ducati. I'm, I'm not sure. I'll probably end up killing myself because I, I – I, sorry, I lied. I did actually take it out for a, for a one, one ride, and it is – It's a beast, hey? Yeah, it's an absolute beast, and I'm wondering <laughs> whether or not my – temperament is suited to <laughs> to a fast bike <laughs> that, yeah I, I i once was given a uh when they first came out the 900 rr fireblade oh, the, nice. the, yeah. the new honda and oh my god like the first bike in a long time that gave me like the adrenaline dump <laughs> and yes. just like i will get myself into trouble on yes this. yeah oh yeah I mean, already, I mean, just in that first ride, I mean, it was just instantly 200 kilometers an hour. And oh, I, yeah. I thought, you, you know, you've, you've, why don't you learn? You know, <laughs> it's just mad. Well, you know, if you had a parachute with a hey, propeller you on your back, <laughs> you know, at some point you could just like punch off the bike and just yeah, sail away. Go. That's got to be an option, surely. And uh, sorry, and land, uh, how did you say you would land? Um not ever so gently, but a light gently. A on light, the ground. yes, yes. Because <laughs> literally, I mean, when you land in one of those things, you, you yeah. pull the risers. I mean, um, like the brakes, yeah. you pull them down to your sides, and it collapses the chute and gives you lots and lots of lift. In other words, it, it, it stalls you onto the ground, yeah. and you can literally step onto the ground. There is no. It's like stepping off one step on a flight of stairs. Nice. It is gentle as that. Well, Unless so there you, you go. Totally screw up. Of course. Add that onto the Ducati. Yeah. You're fine. Yeah, you're, you're fine. fine. That's you're perfect. Fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'll be great. Uh, so it, this is sort of the part of the show where um, I mean, you are an interesting character. Uh, what advice would you give to people that are, you know, uh, like when you were 34, mm-hmm. what did you need to hear or what, what would have helped you get to where you were faster? At you're 34, you're in a job that you don't necessarily love. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that there's more out there. Uh, and now you spent the last 30 years pursuing all that stuff. What advice would you give? Well, the main, if I'm, it, it, I suppose the first thing is to overcome the money trap. Yeah. Because, I mean, I had, and I'm not saying this for any any other reason other than it's what it, what it was. I had a lot of money. And to give that up, to give up your right. Range Rover, your BMW and your big house and everything else, yeah. to do, to step into the unknown and basically lose your massive safety net. Right. But the massive safety net was also a pair of very golden handcuffs. Sure. So it's it's a bit it is a big leap, but you should if you can just get over that and sort of be true to yourself, I guess. Don't don't follow someone else's path like yes, you've got to go for money. Yeah. Because trust me, it's it's just not it. Right. And when you have done your own thing, I'm totally unemployable now. Right. I, I just couldn't be employed by anyone. I, I'm, <laughs> but it, it's um, as soon as you lose the money aspect, yeah. which unfortunately drives everything nowadays. Yeah, um, you've got to have your new Lexus. You've got to have a 
this, this, and this. If you if you could actually lose that and get into something you're passionate about, and the passion is important, then you'll be so much happier. Yeah, it, it, it's very hard to, and it's all right for me because I've done it. Um, but We're, like, take us back to you know, thirty four, going on thirty five, and and taking this plunge. Like, how how freaked out were you? Well, it was a little bit difficult in actual fact because I had a fair portfolio in uh, in England and that was my safety net. So it wasn't, I guess, when I did resign my position um, in this company, I was pretty well set. So yeah. here I am in England, decided to, because I'd been over in Canada a few times and I decided to move to Canada and it wasn't a problem. I could buy a house outright and pursue my dream. Yeah. Now, if you then, the coincidence was that the property market crashed in England in 1988, 89. Oh, okay. And I ended up emigrating to Canada with, uh, I think it was a minus 1,700 pounds. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, so from my, <laughs> oh. my lovely <laughs> amount of money that I had to start my dream over in, in Canada, yeah. I ended up, I remember it distinctly seeing on a, a Ward Air flight or Air Canada, one of the two, coming into Calgary, looking out the window, going, what on earth have I done? Yeah. I know I don't know anyone. I have no money. I had an American Express card, and that was it. Wow. Yep. Fucking A. That's yeah. awesome. And I worked on a building site to start with, Yeah. which is a far cry from what I, I used to do, like getting in a Jet Ranger helicopter or a Citation 3, going to do property deals in Europe. Oh, my God. Working on a... And and you know the funny thing was it was it was totally enjoyable. <laughs> Manual labor right. after an office job is really quite an awakening. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, um, I've got something for you. Uh, I, oh, I okay, <laughs> Friday Sock Companies. Yeah, is excellent. So uh, our the, our show sponsor is the Friday Sock Company. Yeah, and uh, so it, just for the listeners, I've just passed over a pair of uh, mismatched socks to martin on one sock is paper airplanes yeah. and on the other sock is i think paper boats paper boats yeah, yeah. Uh, so they uh, they create uh, purposefully mismatched socks yeah uh, and uh, they're a great sponsor of the show and i want to make sure that you have a, a cool pair to go with your outfit exactly. yes absolutely the matches matches beautifully yeah and i didn't even mention uh, sailing did i Oh, well, let's cover that <laughs> off real quick. <laughs> my, my, my exploits on water are really... Anyway, I'll, I'll give you a quick story. We, yeah. we, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Rick Hill, and I, we got this boat. It was a Gladstone uh, CVX-23. Okay. Really, really quick boat. And uh, I think it had, um, from recollection, it had a 235 Johnson, which was the biggest you could get. <laughs> and so we decided to take up racing skiing, which is like a huge... It's a... I think it's about six, seven foot uh, water ski, mono ski, oh um, and you strap yourself in, and you can do like <laughs> ludicrous speeds. Anyway, so we pull out from where I used to live on the north bank of the Thames. Um, we pulled out and uh, got into the uh, main channel to be met by the P and O hydrofoil coming out of Tilbury, going across to uh, France. Oh shit! So Rick points at it. And he accelerates. We, we were doing about 70, 80 plus miles an hour. What? So we pull up next to the uh, hydrofoil and there are people taking photographs out the window. And uh, the pilot of this thing is sort of waving frantically at us. And so we overtook it. Didn't go in front of it. We just overtook it and veered off round to the, yeah. to the, to the left and... Oh my god! Yeah. Anyway, we were arrested when we got back to the <laughs> back to the slipway. <laughs> yeah. That was hilarious. That's but awesome. it really, really takes it out of you. Holy man, your legs really feel like they've been through a workout. Oh, I bet. Oh yeah. my god. Well, so I, I put it out there. This this show is in uh, fifty countries. So if you have pictures of some madman water skiing <laughs> on the Thames. <laughs> Uh, beside a hydrofoil, yeah. uh, send them into the show so we can see this madman in Perfect. action. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I, I didn't think to bring my camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, uh, Martin, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been oh, it's a pleasure. Awesome, and yeah. uh, I can't wait to see your next project. Oh yeah, well you're welcome to the shop anytime, Mike. Wicked. Yeah. Hey there, Michael Dargy here, and I just want to say thanks so much for listening to Rebel Rebel. 
Before you get on with your day, I'd love a minute of your time for a quick message about this podcast. When I first started this adventure, I made a decision to not limit any of the content behind a paywall or a members only area, but because I think that these stories are so important to hear and I don't want any barriers out there to prevent someone from hearing the stories, getting all the information, uh, because you never know when you're going to hear that one thing that changes everything. Each episode represents a significant amount of time and financial commitment, so I could really use a little help to keep these inspiring stories coming out on a regular schedule. You can donate directly via PayPal on our website, that's therebelrebelpodcast.com, or on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash rebelrebelpod. Thank you so much for taking the time, and I hope you have a kick-ass week. One more thing. If you or someone you know is a rebel who wants to share their story, please reach out through the website, therebelrebelpodcast.com. There's like email links there. There's a little chat bot there. There's even a phone number. Anyway, until next time, I'm your host, Michael Dargy. Hope you guys have an amazing week.